Is that cold? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but why should it be colder here than in the office? It's neat. Well, generally, if you have 100 people, they're Uh, someone in Toronto, in University of Toronto, controls the temperature. I don't know like, why they set it up. Hmm? I think I imagine if people stayed home to watch Chris, otherwise they had to come here to watch Chris early in the morning from here. Alexi and Elliot have just arrived. So
Okay. So I cannot not say anything because something happened since Wednesday till now. So the war started somewhere. So we should at least acknowledge that. And as I tell my students, as it happens from time to time in Israel, that math is a good distraction. Uh, but we should remember that um, more important things happening out there. But uh, that's it for now. All right, so let me remind you where we were last time. I was proving this uh, lemma that as we will see today, we can get a lot of complex analysis out of it. So we have only one expansion of real closed field, a map from the unit disk, which is definable, continuous, and I'll say a word about this. On the interior, it's k-differentiable, but uh, uh, I'll go back to this star at the end. We'll point out that we could have done with much less than that. We take an element w naught in the image, which is outside the image of the of the contour of C. And now we're claiming the following one we showed already. If w zero is not in the image of the whole disk then actually the winding number is zero. We saw that we can shrink the disk and make the point very far away. And then it's easy to see that this normalized map into S1 is not projected. And now we are proving the part, which as I said, is the core, which is false in general for differentiable, for our differentiable functions. And this is where we are aiming. And the part that I know it was a bit technical and maybe people got lost, but I wanted to show how one can use genericity, generic points. So it was important for me to put it on the board. And let me remind you, we saw all I need is that there exists some W1 in the same component of W. So in this picture, the component is that. And W1 at this point is somewhere here, maybe. With the property, two properties. One, F inverse of W1 is finite, only finitely many three images. And two, the derivative, the K derivative at each of these points is non zero for x let me just write even the set i will need it so this is x1 up to some xr and f prime of xi is non-zero so i goes from one to r and i want to point out that actually i did not use k differentiability really for this part we could have started just with an arbitrary definable continuous map. No differentiability assumptions whatsoever. Why? Because we know that in all minimal structure, generically, functions are C1 with respect to R. They're actually C infinity with respect to R. So they are all R differentiable immediately. Just continuity implies that every generic point is R differentiable. The only thing we did use is that the differential is either zero or invertible. That's it. And this is what we have from K differentiability because if the derivative is zero, then of course the Jacobian is zero. If it's not zero, it's immediately invertible. This is false in general for our function. But this is the only thing we used so far. So in particular, we did not need to assume that F was K differentiable on the interior. All we needed is that on a, on a generic set, so outside the set of small dimension, the differential is either, is either zero or invertible. This is the property we are extracting so far for K differentiability, okay? So that's why we will get actually a stronger version of this lemma. Uh, I will say something about that at the end. All right, this is what we have so far. And now I'm gonna do something which is very common in complex analysis. If you take, so let me start here. We have the unique circle. We have x1, x2, and up to xr. For each one of them, we're going to put a very small circle around them. How small? Remember, we said now I'm using k differentiability. We proved before 
that by choosing small enough circle around points where the derivative is non-zero, we know that the winding number with respect to the image, the image is W1, is one at each point like that. So by, by result from last time, there are circles, uh, I'll call them C1, CR, circles centered at x1 up to xr. This joint, we can choose them as small as we want, such that the winding number along ci of f with respect to the image, but the image is w1, is one for each one of them. Okay, now we use differentiability. But again, actually I wrote, I'm gonna bombard you with problem set. So I wrote another problem set I didn't put up. Even though we did need full differentiability, this result about one, all we needed is that the sign of the determinant of the Jacobian is positive. So actually, I think you can do this whole, whatever I did for, with K differentiability, the derivative dif, dif, different than zero, it would have been enough to assume that the sign of the determinant of the Jacobian is positive. But this is just a side remark. All right, and now we do what one does. So this will be hand waving because this is what usually people do in complex analysis in every class. So let's assume we have R equal two and I will just draw a picture. So we have one circle here. We have another circle here. This is C1, this is C2. And now we are connecting this by a path and we go backwards along the same path. We connect this with a path. We go backwards and we do the same here. And now in order to compute the winding number along these, we will actually compute the winding number first along the upper part, then along the lower part. This part and this part, the, the top and the bottom part contribute zero. Why do they contribute zero to the winding number? Because there's no point here which uh, whose image is w1 right so the, the the winding number of f along this circle around w1 is zero the winding number along the bottom part is zero so we turn we get that the winding number along the whole circle w1 in this picture turns out to be just the sum of these two now why does it go no it should go the other way huh Okay. Yeah, it comes out with a minus sum because you have to subtract. I will not write it, but this is classical. The way you do complex, usually you, co you compute integrals. So you get that in this picture, C2, S, W1, this contributes one, this contributes one. So in this picture, you get two. And in the general picture, you will get R. So the winding number of C along around W1 will just be the number of these three images. Each one will contribute one. And in general, so there was some hand waving, but this is really classical computations in complex analysis one. In general, we will get the winding number of F around W1 is equal exactly the number of three images. Each one contributes one. All right, so in particular, it's positive. By the way, otherwise we will just have, if it was, we did not have K differentiability and we just had invertibility, it will be either one or minus one, but then they can add up to zero. If we didn't have K differentiability, K differentiability guarantees that the sign of the determinant of the Jacobian is always positive. All right, so we almost finished, but the only problem that we wanted to get it in w0 around w0 and not around w1 but now this is i will just take a definable path connecting w1 to w0 all you have to make sure is that at no point you cross uh, the image of c 
And now I'm going to apply hand waving the result about homotopy. You can transfer this problem of moving W1 to W0 to a problem about shifting the function homotopically. So by now connecting W1 and W0 by a definable closed curve, a definable continuous curve inside the same inside W, the component, we use the result about homotopy. This, we, this varies continuously. So as we vary W1 to W0, they should have the same uh, uh, winding number using the homotopy. So you have to translate this to a homotopy problem, homotopy result, we get the winding number of F around y, W0 is the winding number of F around W1. And this is R, the number of free images of a generic point. Notice that this implies in particular that in all points, we should have the same number of free images inside this component. All right, I should have said maybe one thing about W1. It was not just any W, yeah, well, it was W1 inside F of D. Otherwise the free images will be nothing. So we work to show that we have a point, actually a generic point inside W intersection F of D. Otherwise the free image will be empty. All right, so we did two. And now for three, which is extremely important that actually the whole component of W is contained in the image. Well, more or less it follows from the same argument. So now pick any W prime in W, not necessarily in the image of D, a priori somewhere else, then as above, the winding number of F around W prime is the same as the winding number of F around W zero, which is positive, we just showed. But then by one, it means that W zero has to be in the image of D, otherwise the winding number would be zero. So by one, W prime is in the image of D. So here we showed that the whole component W is contained in F of D, which was, remember the counter example, the R counter example showed that it's not true without R differentiability. Notice what we showed in particular, that every point in the image of D, which is not on the frontier, which is not on F of C, is an interior point, right? Any point in F of D, which is not on the frontier, is an interior point. If you think for a second, we will be able to get from that exactly the maximum principle, right? So in particular, If F of Z, well, it's definitely in F of C because it's in F of D because it's not in F of C for Z in D, then F of Z is in the interior of F of C. So in a second, we'll translate it and we'll say this is exactly, it implies the maximum principle because only the, you can be on the frontier of F of D only if you are on F of C. All right, now what I wanna say is that because of the remark that I made earlier, all of this is true without the full assumption that F is K differentiable on the interior. It's enough to assume that it's K differentiable outside a definable set of co-dimension one. So you wanted every generic point. Remember what I said, I wanted every generic point. The differential should be either invertible or zero. So it's enough to assume K differentiability on generic points. So it means outside a set of smaller dimensions, right? So the 
lemma hold, even if f is k, it still has to be continuous all the time on d minus l for subset l of dimension one. Or, and this will be, this is a place where O minimality, of course, helps a lot relative to the general picture, because I think this will simplify some of the things that we will need to do later. All right, questions about that? So now we can start concluding complex analysis result, right? Just based on topology, as you see, very little differentiability. All right, so maximum principle, basically we said that. The maximum principle for if f from d to k, let's say again, d the, the, the unit closed unit disk is everything definable continuous and k differentiable okay let me write it immediately the strong version on uh, the interior of d minus l or dim l less than or equal to one actually maybe today already we will see that under these assumptions f will have to be differentiable everywhere k differentiable everywhere right we will have a removal of singularity for situations like that we have here and we have possibly our set is k differentiable outside here but it's k continuous everywhere this will be enough because of O minimality to get it to be actually k differentiable then uh, how shall I say? Absolute value of f attains maximum. It has to attain maximum because it's a continuous function on a compact, on definably compact set, but it attains its maximum on C. So differently, uh, yeah, it means IE is. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, if f of z is maximal, maybe it doesn't mean that z has to be in c, but then there is some z1 in c such that, well, I'll just say that f of, then f of z belongs to f of c. Then f of z belongs to f of c. Right? It doesn't mean that z belongs to c. F is not injective or anything like that. And the proof, we have it, because if F that is not in C, then it's the interior of the image, and it, you cannot attain a maximum in the interior, right? Proof. We saw if F of Z is not in C, then it's contained in the whole connected component of K minus F of C, then F of Z is in the interior of f of d so f of z is not maximal right there is a whole ball around it which is still in f of d okay next the identity theorem I should say a word here because the, the, there is a subtlety that sometimes becomes important, but I think not in this case. Uh, I wrote the result for D, the, the unit disk, but actually the same proof will work by moving to lo locally where C is any simple closed curve and D is the interior of it. Okay, because you can always move and reduce everything to a small disk around your point and show that either you're on the frontier or you're so. This can be translated to arbitrary simple closed curve. All right. Let you 
in K be definably connected, and F open, open F from U to K definable, of course, and K differentiable, K differentiable, possibly again outside the set of dimension one, possibly, but then you have to do continuous. So I have to be, to say possibly F continuous plus K differentiable on U minus L, where L, as I mentioned, one at most. Okay, so continuous I mean on U and K differentiable on a possibly smaller subset. Uh, all right, if F minus one of zero is infinite, So if f takes zero infinitely many times, then it is constantly there. You cannot take the value zero infinitely many times. Of course, in the standard setting, classical setting, you can have because it's possible that the zeros converge to the frontier of the set. And if they converge to the frontier of the set, there is no reason why f should be identically zero. But in our setting, you always have cluster points because definable infinite sets have cluster points. So then actually we are in the classical situation, but with a cluster point, right? But notice that as written, it's stronger than the classical result. Just knowing that you have the infinitely many zeros, unless they have a cluster point inside your domain, you don't know that the function is zero. And this is really one of my favorite arguments that we borrowed from, uh, from the book of, with, of uh, Wyburn. Very nice, I, I really like this one. Of course, his life is much more complicated. There is no minimality things. The massaging that needs to be done will be much more complicated than, on, than what we do, but let's look how we translate his proof to an all minimal proof. Inverse of zero is closed just by continuity. So because U is definably uh, connected, it's enough to show that it's also open. Okay, so assume that F inverse of zero is not the whole of U. So it's not constantly zero. Then by O minimality, or not only by O minimality, this is just true because it's closed, I guess, then U minus F inverse of zero contains an open set. Yeah, this is not only minimality. Is an open set. It's open and non-empty. Okay, now let let's fix. But you will see it. it's not an arbitrary one. We've chosen it as, as a nice point, but we will have to do some some hand waving. But the hand waving, I hope, is not too bad and uh, will still be convincing. Okay, so now what I want to do in the picture. I want to go to the frontier of the set F inverse of zero. Maybe if it's one dimensional, then we just go to it. But if it's not one dimensional, maybe it's two dimensional, we don't know. But let's go to the frontier of the set. And I will draw the frontier of the set like that. So it's, it's not frontier, sorry, the, the boundary of the set. It is inside the set. So this is, let's say, F inverse of zero. We don't care what happens outside here. Uh, can you still see that? Yeah. Still visible, and now I'm I'm putting z zero sufficiently close to this frontier. How much sufficiently close? Sufficiently close that I can draw here a ninety angle, a ninety degrees angle. And now we're going to define an auxiliary function. Mm 
will define H of Z to be equal F of Z times F. We're going to turn everything by 90 degrees. I guess we write it like this, which means we turn the picture clockwise times F I square Z times F uh, minus I Z. Okay, it's definable and it's still k-differentiable, right? We just compose and multiply, so still k-differentiable. Possibly outside a bigger set, the finite union of this uh, translates of L. If L is the problem, we might have to multiply L by I and also remove all of that. But it's k-differentiable on a co-dimension one set, still continuous. Why is it good? Because now let's look at H of zero h inverse of zero ah sorry sorry i want to move z zero to zero sorry let's do the translation without loss of generality because otherwise it won't be good z zero is zero i just look at f of uh, i guess z minus z zero so the picture moves down to zero so what do i have here the zero set is just Take this four times, multiply by i, we get something like that, the original one from f of z, but then each one of them could be zero, and we will get something like that. Right? It's the set there times i times minus times minus, I guess, times minus i. It's just the four translation, four rotation of this zero set here. All right, but now look what happens. Now we have, well, it's not exactly a nice curve, but we have a simple closed curve. We can definitely make it into a simple closed curve on which H is zero. So if we massage the picture well enough, we can make sure that this is actually a simple closed curve. So h uh, of z is zero on this new set c but now by the maximum principle it has to be zero inside in particular h of zero is zero which means that f of z zero Right? The only way it can be because h of zero, which means that f of zero, f of zero is zero, but we assume that zero was like z zero was non zero. This is like z zero after translation. So contradicting the assumption that f of zero, that f of the z zero is outside the zero. So z zero is actually in f inverse of zero contradiction so f on u must be zero right it's some magic it seems to me it's a lot of uh, what uh, Wyburn is doing well it's I should say Wyburn and co-authors because he was collecting stuff from articles just choosing the right path if you talk for a complex analysis, you know that there are many paths to start with. You can start proving the maximum principle. You can start proving Cauchy, integral for Cauchy uh, theorem. You can start in different direction. And this order of things is very clever because usually one proves the identity theorem before you prove, uh, I think, Cauchy's uh, integral theorem. All right. Uh, open mapping theorem, which we more or less have already, but
open mapping theorem. F from U definably connected. I don't think I need definably connected, but I wrote it. Okay, is definable, K differentiable. Again, I'll put the same star I put before, which means possibly outside the set of co dimension one. If F is non constant. Yeah, I guess I need the uh, definably connected because otherwise it could be constant on one and not constant on the other. If F is non constant, then F is open. We almost have it, but there is this issue of being on the frontier or not being on the frontier. Because if we are not in the frontier, we know that uh, we are open. F of Z is, is in the interior. Uh, if we so, let's fix Z zero in side U because F is non-constant and because of the identity theorem. By now, this is we don't need to know that the derivative is non-zero. Right? We had it. If the derivative, okay, I'll write it. By the identity theorem, there is a neighborhood, a punctual neighborhood of Z0, where the function is different than the value of Z0. Then so there is some V. Sorry? There is some V in U, Z0 in V. Actually, uh, even a, a disk, an open disk, an open disk V such that f of z is different than f of z zero for all z in v minus v zero. Otherwise, it will have to be constant function, right? If it took infinitely often the same value, okay, but now, now that's it. In particular, if we draw a circle inside this v, in particular, if this is C now, or C R or C epsilon, so F of Z zero is not in F of C epsilon, right? We found a small neighborhood, so definitely around the circle. It's not. So as we said, F of Z zero is in the interior. of f of v so in particular in the interior of f of u okay so all these classical complex analytic theorems follow from this one lemma on the winding number look it's really uh, maybe surprising uh. all right now let's look at Liouville's theorem remember we said we wanted Liouville so most of you probably know already how to get Liouville from the maximum principle but let's see it again This theorem, I remind you what it is. If you have a global function, which is K differentiable, if F from K to K is, well, for us always definable, and K differentiable, and again, I'm sure, I didn't think of it, but I'm sure it could be K differentiable star on a set of co-dimension one, but it has to be continuous, right? Uh, well, I'm almost sure. 
I, I'll be careful. I'm almost sure. If it and if, if f is bounded, then it is constant. In f is bounded, then f is constant. The bounded entire function must be constant. So if you don't remember, I'll remind you how the proof goes. I think this is the usual proof. We fix any arbitrary point in K, and we want to show that the derivative has to be zero. If we'll show that the derivative is zero everywhere, then well, hmm. yeah, okay, I'll say it and then we'll, yeah, we don't know yet that the function whose derivative is zero everywhere, is, ah, we know it for our differentiable function. Sorry, for our differentiable functions, we know that if the Jacobian is zero everywhere, then the function is constant. Then if we show that the derivative is zero everywhere, it will be constant, okay? And now let h of z be the f of z minus f of z zero divided by z over z zero for z different than z zero. And the derivative as prime of z zero when z equal to zero. This is a priori on the upper half plane, on the upper part is not a global function. Now we made it a global function. And uh, the, because the limit of this is f prime of z zero, then we know that h of z, first of all, is continuous. Notice we don't have yet removal of singularities. We cannot say that H is actually K differentiable. We didn't prove it yet, but uh, H is continuous everywhere. This is for sure and differentiable outside possibly Z zero. Yeah, maybe the classical proof uses, uses the removable singularities here. And K differentiable on k minus z zero, but this is good enough. Definitely, we even could show them that for the uh, maximum principle, we could show the maximum principle even if we remove the set of dimension one. So definitely, for a single point, there is no problem. And now we continue as usual, as one does it in classical setting we start drawing bigger and bigger circles around z zero using the fact that the function is global, right? We have z zero somewhere in the world and we start drawing, let's call him CR. So we look at uh, <coughs> now for all R greater than zero, consider uh, the function, how do I call it, h, consider h on uh, the disk, let's call it dr0, disk, dr, sorry, disk uh, centered at z0, radius r, by the maximum principle, we have that h of z, h of z zero, I guess, is less than or equal than the value on the frontier on the circle max of h of z for z in CR, the frontier. And what is this? The, this is, maximum of f of z minus f of z zero. And the bottom is exactly the distance from the frontier to z zero, which is r. And this goes to zero as r, ah, because f is bounded, right? So because f, this is the whole point, we didn't use this bounded, but this goes to zero as r goes to infinity. And it's always defined, the function is defined everywhere. so. We can make the circle as big as we want. 
because f is bounded so the bottom the numerator is bounded the bottom goes to zero so so h of z zero which you remember is just the derivative zero so we do it for every z zero so it depends now I'll use the real annotation, the Jacobian notation. Uh, the Jacobian of F is zero for all Z in R2, which is K. And now just by O minimality, we know that when you have a function whose derivative is zero everywhere, the function is constant. Uh, yeah. Constant, for example, by Lau's book. The R differentiability part, right? So this is the R, the R Jacobian. Any questions or everyone in a state of shock? Yeah. Okay. All right, so I can maybe get one more. So let's do removal of singularities because now in the version that I write it, I think that it is, well, actually it's a good question. If classically this is true or not, maybe it's true. I'll write a statement and so I'm going to start actually with a version that I don't think uh, well, then maybe there is an analog of this, but uh, classically, but then well, so I'll, I'll write it down and then maybe we can say something about it. Okay, let's have F again. Let's assume it's the unit disk for simplicity. It doesn't matter. It's all a local statement. So F from D to K is always definable, K differentiable. No, sorry, is continuous. Now I want to write the whole thing. It's important. Is definable, continuous, and K differentiable on the interior minus a one dimensional set. At most one with dimension of L. Right? Not a single point. Usually we give this result for a single point, but then we assume only boundedness. But here we assume, right now I'm assuming continuity. Then F is actually K differentiable on the whole of D naught. Sorry. Now, I don't know if there is an analog of this classically where uh, let's say you have just a complex analytic function, which is holomorphic on the open disk. Maybe there are people in the audience who know outside let's say a real analytic curve or outside some uh, nice continuous curve but let's say even real analytic curve uh, uh, is it possible like somehow yeah actually yeah I i'll just say in a second it follows from what i'm doing but i wonder if, if it exists in literature but if it's real analytic or even if yeah if it's even all minimal let's I'll point out in a second that it No, 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 I'm sorry. No, I don't know. So I'm asking a question if anyone knows of an analog of this in the classical setting. I thought we can always move to a smaller set and get the function, even if it's just complex analytic, to say that it's definable in an ominous structure. But because we have it complex analytic outside the set, I don't know if one can say that this is definable anywhere in R sub n or anything so i don't know if we can reduce the classical problem to this problem so i'm i'm leaving this open is there an analog of this 
there must be, I'm guessing, in the classical setting or not. Uh, I hope the question makes sense, right? Like you take a complex analytic function on a disk minus some real analytic curve, but it's continuous everywhere. Does it have to be complex analytic everywhere? Okay, now let me see what I can say. I will not give a full proof of that, but I will try to describe the general picture of what we are doing in these. So we have here uh, L, and let's pick some Z zero point on L. So pick Z zero. In L, we want to show that F is differentiable there. But what we can show first step that the difference quotient, the famous different quotient, is bounded. So claim F of Z minus F of Z naught defined divided by Z minus Z naught is bounded near Z zero. I think I have time to do that. So what we do, we pick a point, any point Y first, somewhere here, and we define so for Y in D minus L, we define an auxiliary function HY of Z to be F of Z minus F of Y divided by Z minus Y, was it different than y? And f prime of y, notice that it's defined because y is outside for z equal to y. So now each hy, each hy is continuous on the whole of D because we made sure that it's continuous. The limit is Y approaches as a, a Z approaches Y is F prime of Y. And K differentiable on D naught. And now we have to take out L. L was problematic from the beginning. Union another point Y. Right, that's why we don't know if it's K differentiable h of y so i'm almost finished i think so by the maximum principle by the maximum principle HY for each such Y, HY of Z0 is less than or equal the maximum for uh, Z in the frontier of the whole circle of uh, the absolute value of H of Y. But now we can write F of Z minus F of Y divided by Z minus Y. Right, we don't need to consider. Uh, yeah, we just look at the on the frontier of, of some of this circle. And the point is now notice if we take y only in a small neighborhood of z zero, then the distance between y and points on c is bounded below. Okay, so. For y, for y near z naught, which is all we are interested in, there will be a uniform bound of all of that. There will be some fixed m. Why? Because this will be bounded below z minus y will be bounded below by the distance from here to here. 
All right, so this implies exactly what we needed. So for all, and we only need to care about y which are close to z0 because this is what we're interested in, uh, z0. Sorry, could be? Minus y is bounded Kobe. by m. This is hy of z0. Kobe, do you hear me? Sorry? Yeah, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, little questions. You don't take the up, uh, you don't take the absolute value of h y of z zero. Uh, I don't. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. You're right. You're right. You're right. Ah, okay. Okay. There's no meaning to that. Okay. Thank you. Of course, there is no meaning. I cannot write the value of a function. If I did it before, I apologize. Did I do it there? I don't think so. I think no, so. No, okay. Here I had. No, here I had the absolute value. Sorry. Yes. Of course. Of course. Of course. It makes no sense. Ten. Thank you very much. All right, so let me just finish here. So we see that indeed this is bounded. So sorry, what, what is, no, 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 what's going on? Uh, does it show that this is bounded? What, something? Uh, yes, this is fine. We, I just replaced Y and Z, doesn't matter. So, right, right. So F, f of y f of z doesn't matter minus f of z zero divided by y minus z zero is bounded notice it means that in all minimality that every path that we take when we approach from y to z zero we will always get a limit here it doesn't say that it's differentiable because maybe the limits will not be the same but by all minimality once you have a bounded function like that I'll just say that and I'll finish minimality for every path for every path I don't know how to call it uh, gamma t approaching z0 there will be a limit so at least we know that f of gamma t minus f of z0 divided by gamma t minus z0 has a limit at z0. But now we need to show that they are, they are all the same limits. In order to get that actually there is one limit to this difference, we have to show that they all have the same limit. I will not do it. You have to use again the maximum principle, but uh, I will not do it. So I will, then over time, sorry. <laughs> I will start from here next time. I will start from assuming this singularity, removal of singularity next time. All right, so that's it. Kobe. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is, yeah, the business about, um, about removal of, of uh, curves and so on. There's a lot of literature about this. But it's usually, um, I mean, I, 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 the only the only time I ever see it in um, in the normal literature is where you're doing a straight line, mm -hmm. and then uh, the trick uh, the, the trick to this this is an exercise in Conway's book, for example. And to make things easy, you say uh, suppose you're uh, you know everywhere defined. Um, you know, and so you, you don't have to worry about, you know, boundary, weird boundary values. But so you have this, you can use Morera's theorem and some sort of uh, geometric, uh, and I do mean geometry arguments to show that you, you, the line integral over any triangle has to vanish. And so if the triangle doesn't intersect a line, then of course it vanishes by Cauchy's theorem. If it does, then you break it up and you, you know, um, Right, right. Yeah. Right. So I mean, I, I don't know if this how this well this works. It's an easy think, argument that way. But now, now that I've said that, I think I understand that there is a theorem about removal of singularities of Bishop. I think that says that if you remove a set of uh, I don't remember of lower Hausdorff dimension even. So he does it in several variables. So if you remove a set, I think just lower Hausdorff. So the Hausdorff dimension. Whatever it's, I forget how it is, you know more. The house of, 
the two houses of dimension should be zero, something like that, then I think you can extend, you can uh, uh, remove the singularity. So when okay. I get to the higher dimension, actually, I, I remembered it in higher dimension. I've never seen it in dimension one, but I'm sure it's true in dimension one as well. So there is a theorem like this with very weak assumption on L. Yeah, the thing is that the, the proofs tend to be more complicated than you want your students to try to write up. So, so it's for homework, I, I assign this one where you're just removing a, 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 you know, where it's just a line and then you can just right. use this triangle argument. Right. It's a good exercise right. in, in trying to use, uh, in trying to figure out a civilized way. <laughs> no, this is civilized, why not? Yeah, I, I can send you a copy. I actually have a copy of uh, of my answer. I can send it to you if you want to see it. I don't know if it's any good for your setup, though. Still, it's well, nice. If, if it's a line, then we have it anyway because it's uh, it's all minimal. But uh, ah, but you, but the function you don't assume anything. You just assume continuity plus uh, differentiability outside. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's basically it. Right, right. Right. Yeah. But if you had something really nasty, then you'd have to be careful. Right. But I think for the nasty, there is a paper of Bishop, which I think is the strongest version. I think there are several kinds of removal of singularities, usually in higher dimension. Uh, there is one of, uh, well, I'll mention it. Uh, I don't remember off my head. All right. Anyway, Thanks. yeah. Very Thanks, Chris. Uh, very Thanks very much. Sure. See you.